dedicate my lecture today, which is on an aspect that I believe is fundamental to the well-being of the legal profession, the ascendancy of the Supreme Court to his memory. The Constitution had brought into existence the three separate and independent organs of state, equal and coordinate, and one with the other. Today, it is a public perception that the higher judiciary in the country occupies the position of preeminence among these, these three organs of the state and not yet attained by any other judiciary in any other part of the world. It is, however, intriguing that the founding fathers had a deep suspicion that they were creating something akin to a monster which would turn on its creator, creator being the Constituent Assembly and later the Parliament itself. During the deliberations of the Constituent Assembly, Sri Titi Krishnamachari expressed dark forebodings. He said, I don't know whether any of you have uh, uh, come across this when reading the constitutional debates. He said, it might be that to give the judiciary an enormous amount of power, a judiciary which may not be controlled by any legislature in any manner, except by the means of ultimate removal, we may perhaps be creating a Frankenstein monster which could nullify the intentions of the framers of the Constitution. He says, I have in mind the difference that was experienced in another country, and that is the United States. Sir Aladi, Krishna Swami Ayer, too struck an ominous note when he said, the doctrine of independence is not to be raised to the level of a dogma, so as to enable the judiciary to function as a kind of superior legislature or a superior executive. B. N. Rao, constitutional advisors, also had his doubts about arming the Supreme Court with such vast powers. His warning to the Constituent Assembly was in the following words The courts, manned by an irremovable judiciary, not so sensitive to public needs in the social or economic sphere as the representatives of a periodically elected legislature, will in effect have a veto on legislation exercisable at any time and at the instance of any litigant. The early years of the Supreme Court, as is well known, were years of conflict. And uh, there are very many judgments, particularly on land reforms, were struck down by Parliament by, and had to be neutralized by Parliament by amending the Constitution. So much so, Justice Hidya Tula pointed out in Golaknath's case, in 1967, two Supreme Court reports, 7621. In our country, amendments have so far been made only with the object of negative negativing the Supreme Court decisions. Now, I would like all of you to pause and think. Are these persons, the founding among the founding fathers, are they justified at all in such a Fears being expressed. One. Number two, have these fears materialized? Now, if you look carefully at it, you will find very many areas where the Supreme Court, according to me, has turned the provisions of the Constitution for its own uh, uh, ex for exercising powers, which the Founding Fathers never intended uh, to give to the judges of the Supreme Court or even of the high courts. Take, for example, the appointment of judges of the high court and Supreme Court. The Article 124 of the Constitution said that the president may appoint judges for the higher judiciary in consultation with the chief justice and other judges of the Supreme Court of India. What is it that has happened? First, by judgment, they said that this word consultation should be treated as, uh, <coughs> as concurrence. 
that is not justified for the simple reason if you go through the uh, debates you will find this very suggestion was put to an amendment which has moved saying why consultation why not we have concurrence so that you may not uh, go over the heads of the judiciary but so far as the uh, uh, dr ambedkar is concerned he replied by saying we cannot have this because one single person may do great damage to the institution you have to remember that so far as judges are concerned they, they do not have a constituency they have only the knowledge they have acquired which may be that uh, they are uh, have uh, required when they while practicing in the while listening to cases in the high court and then uh, uh, in the supreme court the result of that is they are governed by their own background which may be perhaps uh, we say that that judge is uh, le left uh, left of the center and some judges are central some judges are right of center and you know in advance before arguing a case whether so far as the judge is concerned he is likely to decide in favor labor or in favor of industry and so on now this is unlike the legislators so far as they are concerned they have a constituency so far as uh, uh, they are concerned a law is passed only after referring it to the select committee or after a full debate I mean, not uh, forget uh, what has been happening in uh, recent years. A full debate in uh, Parliament, and amendments are moved, corrections made, or a select committee is appointed, and so on. You don't have all that when uh, the matters are being discussed. And mind you, the Supreme Court of India sits in divisions, just like the High Court, and there are thirty judges and perhaps thirteen uh, divisions. So, if it comes before one court, you get this judgment. If the same case goes before some other judge, you may get a different judgment. Because, as uh, somebody said, they are not like slot machines, where uh, you put in your this and pull the lever, and the same result comes forward about the case. It is not possible, and therefore, in those circumstances, you will find uh, the judges rowing uh, far and wide. In regard to the decisions on cases, one judge says, if the government of India passes a law and says you cannot have liquor vents along the uh, national highways, the court says no. Why along the highways? Why not have it 500 meters away? And 500 meters away means that there are very many hotels which uh, would be excluded because they also extended. the law to not merely national highways but also to highways passing through towns and cities what what does this mean most of the big hotels would be established on that tourists come in they from different countries they want a drink and they are tired exhausted they land up in the night but that's not possible because you are really uh, uh, providing for uh, total prohibition in vast sections of the country but when this was all brought to the notice they changed it made it 100 meters 100 meters 500 meters would make no difference look recently at what has been happening in relation to the uh, uh, pandemic itself various orders are being passed and uh, question is so far as government is concerned they find it very difficult if uh, their well considered decisions are uh, turned out of course i am not speaking as attorney general take it from me but with me as a senior advocate who has been watching what has been happening and uh, let me tell you somebody mentioned i have put in 50 years of experience i have put in 67 years because i was enrolled on the 15th so on the 16th of january in uh, 1954 in calculating from january 1954 it will be 67 years but it makes no difference what sir whether it is uh, 50 years or 67 years or 67 years
Yeah, what I find is that uh, so far as uh, the big cases are concerned, my father was a lead counsel in the Golaknath case. Golaknath, uh, by judgment, was a major blow to parliamentary supremacy. Now, my father, the late uh, CM Kenavia, had led the arguments in the case. He had preferred the theory. Uh, he uh, uh, started the theory of basic structure in that case. That is referred to by two of the judges. And that was based an article on an article written by a German jurist, Dieter Conrad. And uh, he read the entire article to the court so that they know that it was his uh, thoughts which he was putting over as best as good. The amendments to the constitution had no higher status than that of any other law made by parliament. And to the extent that the encroach on fundamental rights would have to be declared void by reason of Article 13 of the Constitution, is what Bolatnat said. Considering that the result of the judgment would be to invalidate all the past amendments in the Constitution, they evolved the principle of prospective overruling. With this, the lines of confrontation were clearly drawn. Parliament had no other alternative than to neutralize the Bolatnat judgment. Article 368 and Article 13 were amended. It was then that the matter was again taken up and the validity of the 24th Amendment to the Constitution was uh, discussed in uh, uh, the in the case of the Bharati case. And uh, mind you, so far as uh, our famous uh, uh, this uh, RC senior lawyer is concerned, he argued brilliantly and uh, put over Nani Palkiwal, put over uh, the case that there is some unwritten rules by which a constitution had to be limited to its uh, four corners. Otherwise, you could convert a democracy into a autocratic uh, government. The parliament could exercise the power of extending the length of uh, the tenure of uh, parliament from uh, five years to each year, uh, is from five years to 10 years, 12 years. It would postpone elections from five years to 15 years so that the uh, uh, members of parliament who are elected could entrench themselves in power and could pass arbitrary laws. All this would be the result unless there was some uh, unwritten limitations on the powers which parliament could exercise. And that was how the basic uh, structure theory came into existence. Now, <clears throat> yeah, of course, it had its repercussions. Chief Justice Sikri they delivered the judgment and retired the next day. But three of our very eminent judges, including Justice K.S. Egede and uh, Shellett and uh, one more judge, all of them had to be superseded. They should have become senior chief judges of India. They were deprived of that. And, uh, and the result was that as so far as the end race concerned, he became the chief justice. But so far as the executive was concerned and the political wing of the state, they were not happy. And Mohan Kumar Mangalam, the then Minister of Steel, in a monograph on judicial appointments, had this to say, dealing with the period after 1967. He said the experience of the last six years, an unfortunate period, where a virtual confrontation was taking place between the judiciary and parliament of confusion and uncertainty in the law. It has to be understood and correct conclusions drawn from it. He extracted a speech of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru at the time the constitution was framed. And he said, no Supreme Court and no judiciary can stand in judgment over the sovereign will of parliament representing the will of the entire community. If you go wrong here and there, 
he can point it out. But in the ultimate analysis, where the future of the community is concerned, no judiciary can come in the way. Therefore, if such a thing occurs, they should draw attention to the fact. But it is obvious that no court, no system of judiciary can function in the nature of a third house, as a kind of third house of correction. If so, it is important that with this limitation, the judiciary should function. But we have a union minister who, during the height of emergency on the 28th of October 1976, made a frontal attack on the Supreme Court of India and uh, quoted as it were, without acknowledging Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt and the address to the nation when he had to pack the court, when he threatened to pack the Supreme Court of the United uh, States because the social legislation which he was passing one by one was struck down by the Supreme Court of the United States. An atmosphere of confrontation was sought to be created by those whose duty it was to see that they did not encroach upon the field, we did not legitimately belong to them. Nothing should be left undone now to ensure that such a situation did not recur. If even after the amendment, that is the 42nd amendment to the Constitution, confrontation continues, then I think it will be a sad day for the judiciary. And again, we are trying to save them, that is the judiciary, from the temptation to intrude into powers we do not belong to them. What we are doing today is not to save the people from the judges, but really enabling the judges to save them from themselves. Now, it's a part of history that the emergency was declared, the constitution was the fundamental rights were put in suspension, and uh, the judiciary was in afraid of what would happen to them. But today, we have a very strong judiciary which is not concerned with what the government thinks or the government feels. It acts on its own, it passes uh, judgments which intrude. If you take any one of its uh, recent judgments and so on, into areas which are prohibited to it, which are in the area of executive power, even in the nature of legislation. They tell the, um, it may be the law officers, look, this is not correct. I think we should pass a law like to this effect. And they tell the, uh, that parliament should pass a law and what law it should pass clearly that would be impeding or infringing the powers with the judiciary, with the parliament processes. Recently, I think uh, the government decided that they would not uh, uh, implement the judgment as it stands. In the case of the integration of the tribunals, so far as the court is concerned, they said it was something which is, according to me, not very important. The the finance bill said, and the rules made there under of uh, 2017, that uh, the tenure of the tribunals, and there were 19 tribunals, and each one had so many judges that they would have only for four years or uh, a four years tenure, but it could be reappointed. The court said, no, not four years, but five years. They struck down four years and said, it will be five years. Now, uh, the government then passed an you know, ordinance by which they reiterated in the teeth of the judgment, notwithstanding any judgment of the courts, will, uh, the tenure will be four years. And they had said that advocates with 10 years' experience should be appointed as members. Now, a graduate lawyer will be about 23 years old, 10 years will make it 33 years old. Now, what will be the effect of it? It means that so far as the judge is concerned, it says that a high court judge will be appointed with 10 years experience. But in fact, the, there are unwritten rules by which unless they are 45 and above, they will not be appointed, which means 23 to 45, which means about 22 years or so of experience. 
Therefore, government didn't accept it. They said all members will have only 50 years of experience. Now, as a result of which, so far as this is concerned, they, differ, they did not implement the judgment. But they said, notwithstanding any judgment, it will be four years. Notwithstanding any judgment, it will be 50 years or all, which means that no 10 years. Now, again, this was struck down by the courts. And as a result of which, again, a law has been passed. Now. And the law says the bill has been passed by the uh, uh, by the uh, lower house, by uh, the Lok Sabha. And there they have reiterated four years instead of five years, 50 years, as it was before it was filled up. Now, this means that at a certain stage, even parliament will start wondering, are we not having any powers whatsoever or the, the parliament will there be, or the judiciary will there be interfering with it? to dissection. Yeah.